Hello, everybody, and welcome to part three in the Apocalypse of Abraham. This might be the final installation. We'll see how far along we get. If we don't finish the Apocalypse of Abraham this week, then we will definitely be finishing it up next week. As always, if you would like to join us for the live reading of the Apocalypse of Abraham on David Zublik's channel, that happens on Tuesdays from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So David Zublik is not on YouTube. He does have a channel on BitChute and Rumble, but he also has his own platform, The Dark Outpost TV, which a link to that is down in the description box below. And that is the platform that I know he prefers to use, I prefer to use, because it, it is his own platform. Uh, therefore, there is no censorship, and we are allowed to speak as freely as we would like to speak regarding certain topics. Now, I know there is a small monthly fee. I think it's like $2 or something a month. It's very, very, very affordable. That literally is just for the upkeep of his platform. And I do know that he donates a, a portion of that money to an organization that helps with children who have gone through horrific, horrific things if you know what I mean. As my channel is still up on YouTube, I can't go into details about what this charity does to support children, but I think most of you get what I'm saying. Now, as always, is if this is your first time on my channel, welcome, welcome, welcome. I would suggest going back and listening to part one of the Apocalypse of Abraham in part two before listening to part three so that it all makes sense. There will be links to those two episodes down in the description box as well where you can just click on and watch those first before then proceeding with this installment. So we left off with Abraham being initiated into the total enlightenment or total understanding of what God is. Now, if you remember from part one, Abraham was born into a family that were polytheistic. They worshiped many gods, which was common at the time of Abraham's birth. And from a very, very young age, Abraham didn't quite understand. He was a little bit more skeptical of his father's faith. If you remember, he had questions, he observed things, he watched things. The, the fact that within nature we have all these powerful forces like water and like the sun and the moon and the earth itself, but none of these forces are any powerful than the other because the sun can dry up the water. The water can be forceful enough to cause a flood. And the moon can then take the power away from the sun. So he's observing that these really powerful natural forces that people tend to worship as particular gods were actually puzzle pieces connected to the same source. So that there had to be something behind all of these powerful natural entities that were directing them to do what they do. One singular. So we're coming from polytheism to monotheism. And if you know anything about the history of Abraham, Abraham is the father of three religions. These are the religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So once Abraham figures out he has this kind of epiphany that um, there's something else behind everything, God reveals himself to Abraham and he does this through his archangel Joel. And the interesting thing about Joel is Joel is the angel that was responsible for helping take down the Watchers, which comes heavily into play in the Book of Enoch, which is a book that we will be covering eventually. This was right before the Flood. And he is also responsible for holding back all these demons until the end of time. And we know the end of time as in the, the actual apocalypse. And again, all apocalypse means is to lift the veil, that all these demons would be released, and then they would be taken out for good where we would then be living in a thousand years of peace, which my opinion that we are right now at this point in our timeline. So Abraham and Joel have now initiated his initiation into understanding God. He's gone up through the different firmaments 
the different layers of the atmosphere. Now, I have said this plenty, plenty times. I have no idea at this point in our Great Awakening. I personally have absolutely no idea what our Earth actually looks like. We know for sure that certain government scientific organizations like NASA are dishonest. We know that nothing that comes out of NASA now is the truth at all. Um, but I'm also not 100% sold on a flat earth either. And we did uh, ask Janine that question once Tom and I asked her, like, what, what, what is our earth? What, what are we standing on? And the cards basically said that it's not, it's not time for us to understand that yet. Basically, hold on, we've got some other things to learn first. So this whole apocalypse of Abraham, we're definitely seeing this picture of um, an earth and an atmosphere that's different from what we have been taught by the official narrative. All right, so let's get chart. So let's get started appropriately with chapter 17. So they're going up through the firmament. And this is titled, this whole section is titled, Abraham taught by the angel utters the celestial song and prayers for enlightenment. And I am gonna be reading some of the notes that have been left here by Professor Box. I am again reading the translation by Professor Box. Somebody asked me in the comment section if this is an old and missing text that should have been in the Bible, then why is it in Old English? Well, that's because it was translated from Hebrew. All right, Hebrew, actually from Hebrew to Greek to Old Syrian to now English. And Professor Box lived in the early 20th century. This translation was released in 1918, I believe. Um, and so he would have translated it. The English that we, he would have translated it into would have been Old English because that was the proper form in translation in his time. Uh, professor Box was a Hebrew professor at King's College in London. So I definitely take what he says seriously. And so I am gonna be reading some of his notes though that he has in this text, but that's why it's in Old English. It's not in Old English because that's how it was found. It was not found in Old English. It's just how Professor Box chose to translate it. All right, so chapter 17. And while he yet spake, and lo, fire came against us round about, and a voice was in the fire like a voice of many waters. All right, so I'm gonna come down here and read some notes that Professor Box has left. So the divine presence is revealed by fire and God himself is spoken as a consuming fire. But here the fiery chariot, which bore the divine presence is probably thought of. So we're seeing this presence of fire, which we do see that referenced a lot in the canonized Bible. And we also see when it says a fire like the voice of many waters, we have a note here. This feature is part of a supernatural coloring, so characteristics of the apocalypse. The heavenly light is of a dazzling brilliance. The divine voice is like thunder. And I desire to fall down upon the earth and the high place on which we stood at one moment rose upright, but at another rolled downward. So here we have a note. This description is interesting. The seer has ascended as with many winds to heaven and is standing on the height. He experiences a strong feeling of desire to fall down upon the earth because the high place on which he is standing with the angel at one moment rose up and at another plunged downward. The commotion is produced by the divine voice. So he's feeling the vibration of the voice of God. And it kind of sounds like, I don't know, I grew up up here in like North Georgia where I grew up, we're at the base of the Appalachian Mountains. And so there's a lot of hills. There's a lot of hills here in Atlanta. Even when we go like take our dog out, like we're constantly having to hike up and down hills. Um, and when we were children, I had this one friend who lived at the bottom of this hill. Her neighborhood went straight downhill. But it was one of those hills where if you went over it at a certain way, the car would make your stomach go, whoop, you know, you kind of would get that like, it was almost like being on a roller coaster. We would beg our mom to like speed up as she would go over the hill to go to my friend's house, just so we would get that roller coaster like feeling. And so if you are 
if you are familiar with that kind of, of, of neighborhood where you go over those hills, if you had that when you were a child, if you know what I'm talking about, I think that's what Abraham is experiencing. He's experiencing almost like this roller coaster ride because of the vibration of God's voice is causing everything to respond to it. That's how powerful it is. And of course, when Abraham or whoever wrote this this text was writing this text, they didn't have the word roller coaster, right? But that is kind of what it sounds like to me. If it sounds like something different to you, then please leave me that in the comments below. And he said, so he, the angel, said, Only worship Abraham and utter the song which I have taught thee, because there is no earth to fall upon. And I worshipped only and uttered the song which he had taught me. And he said, Recite without ceasing. And I recited, and lo, he also with me recited the song. So before we get into the song, let's look at this note that Professor Box has left us. Only the angels understand how to utter the divine song of praise. Though the blessing among mortals may, as here, be taught to sing thus in a state of ecstasy. Each of the angelic spheres has its own voice. And the angelic language is incomprehensible to mortals, and through the illuminated and inspired seer may be taught both to understand and utter such words. The exalted Enoch in heaven underwent a similar experience. Again, this is coming back to the book of Enoch, which we have not covered yet, but we will be covering eventually. So this is quoting from the book of, of Enoch. I fell on my face and my whole body melted away, but my spirit was transfigured and I cried with a loud voice. And also did Isaiah. According to Philo, no beings can adequately exp express the praise due to God. And that makes sense to me. It's kind of like when we, when we see people under go a near-death experience. Like I've talked about my grandfather's near-death experience. He now has a, since passed away. But when he was in his 40s, he had a near-death experience where he remembers seeing a light. And for people who have experienced this, oftentimes they say the same thing. They can only describe it as a light. They always say like they can't really tell you specifically what the light looks like because it's more brilliant than any light that we mortals have on our plane of reality. And so it kind of seems here it's the same thing. It's like they're trying to explain to us what this divine atmosphere looks like, but they can't really do it justice because it's just something that's so foreign to mortals. I hope that makes sense. All right, so here's the song, the mantra, the prayer that they are reciting in this without ceasing, so over and over and over again, like a mantra, like a prayer, now that Abraham has been able to go into the divine realm. Eternal, mighty, holy El, God only supreme, Thou who art self-originated, incorruptible, spotless, uncreate, immaculate, immortal, self-complete, self-illuminating, without father, without mother, unbegotten, exalted, fiery one, lover of men, benevolent, bountiful, jealous over me, and very compassionate. Now this sounds exactly like the Apocryphon of John. If y'all remember, I'll, I'll put a link to the Apocryphon of John down in the description box below if you missed that, which basically talked about the self-originating God, that the Supreme God created itself. Okay, sounds very, very familiar. Eli, that is my God, eternal, mighty, holy, Sabbath. So this is S-A-B-A-O-T-H, Sabbat, Sabbath. Um, and he has a note here, the use of a Sabbat alone is a designation of God is unusual, but not unexampled. So basically, he's writing here that there is actually a lot of references to, to God being called a Sabbat um, in other works of Jewish origin, like the Apocalypse of Abraham. And so we'll probably run across that in other works we study, but that's just his notes there. The very glorious LLL Joel, Thou art he whom my soul hath loved, eternal protector, shining like fire, whose voice is like the thunder, whose look is like the lightning, all seeing, who receiveth the prayers of such an honor as thee. In thy heavenly dwelling place there is no need of any other light than that of the unspeakable splendor from the light of thy countenance. Accept my prayer. 
and be well pleased with it. Likewise also the sacrifice which thou hast prepared, thee through me who sought thee, accept me favorably, and show me and teach me, and make me known to thy servant as thou hast promised me. So this brings us now to chapter 18, and this is titled, Abraham's Vision of the Divine Throne. And while I was still reciting the song, the mouth of the fire, which was on the surface, rose up on high, and I heard a voice like the roaring of the sea, nor did it cease on account of the rich abundance of the fire. So even though there's a lot of external noise from the fire of, of the divinity, he can still hear the voice. That's how powerful it is. And as the fire raised itself up, ascending into the height, I saw under the fire a throne of fire, and round about it all seeing once, reciting the song, and under the throne four fiery living creatures singing, their appearance was one, each one of them with four faces. So Bach gives us a note here that the idea of these beings having multiple faces is common with the cherubim. We saw that referred to in the, an earlier section of the Apocalypse of Abraham where Joel was explaining to uh, Abraham that he was there when some of the cherubim went bad, which is the whole story of the flood and the watchers and Nephilim, you know, the angels mating with human women. So, so we're still seeing another reference to cherubim here, and they oftentimes have multiple faces. And such was the appearance of their countenance, of a lion, of a man, of an ox, and of an eagle. And four heads were upon their bodies, so that the four creatures had sixteen faces, and each had six wings from their shoulders and their sides and their loins. All with two wings from their shoulders, they covered their faces with the two wings which sprang from their loins, they covered their feet, while the two middle wings were spread out for flying straight forward. And when they had ended the singing, they looked at one another and threatened one another. And so Box has a note here. So he says, the underlying idea of this strange representation seems to be that of emulation and rivalry. So that's interesting that he notes that this is like emulation. They, they love God, but they're also kind of looking at each other like in rivalry, almost like sibling rivalry. Not necessarily threatening, but, but just rivalry. That's interesting. And it came to pass when the angel who was with me saw that they were threatening each other, and he left me and went running to them and turned the countenance of each living creature from the countenance immediately confronting him in order that they might not see their countenance threatening each other. And he taught them the song of peace, which had its original in the eternal one. So basically, because Joel is an archangel, he's kind of like the babysitter, in my opinion, because that's kind of how I see archangels of like all these beings on God's behalf, not just man, but other angels. And so whenever there's maybe a little bit of a spat or a rivalry happening, he's going to step in and like calm them down and be like, hey, 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 it's okay. That's kind of how I read that. And as I stood alone and looked, I saw behind the living creatures a chariot with fiery wheels, each wheel full of eyes round about, and over the wheels was a throne, which I saw, and this was covered with fire, and fire encircled it around about, and lo, an indescribable fire environed a fiery host, and I heard its holy voice like the voice of a man. So we are kind of seeing the entrance of God here. It kind of reminds me of some scenes we've seen in movies when huge chariots come in with a king or a queen, except for now it's like the ultimate king and queen, it's God, you know. I would love, if there are any artists out there listening to this reading, I would love if you want to sketch that whole description out that I just read, and if you need for me to send you the PDF of the uh, Apocalypse of Abraham for you to see, the writing so you can sketch it out. I would love for you to do that. And if you send it to me, I will I will put it on the channel for sure because that is quite a sight to behold the way he's described it. All right, this brings us to chapter 19. God discloses to Abraham the power of heaven. And a voice came to me out of the midst of the fire saying, Abraham, Abraham. And I said, here I am. So the week before last on David's show, before David went on vacation, um, I was we were kind of laughing because Throughout the apocalypse of Abraham, we have Abraham going. We have Abraham and 
God or the angels like calling out for each other. And it's always Abraham, Abraham, and he always responds, here I am. So it's kind of like Marco Polo, like they're Marco Polo. And every time I read that, I just see this, this game of Marco Polo happening in like the, the uh, beautiful chaos of the firmament, if that makes sense. So, and he said, consider the expanses which are under the firemint on which thou art now placed, and see how no single expansion is there any other but he whom thou hast sought, or who hath loved thee. And while he was yet speaking, and lo, the expanses opened, and beneath me the heavens, and I saw upon the seventh firmament upon which I stood, a fire wildly extended in light and dew and a multitude of angels and a power of the invisible glory over the living creature which i saw but no other being did i see there so he is on the seventh firmament so he's seven layers above the earth and that's the note that box has here he says abraham is now presumably placed and he put placed in quotation marks in the seventh heaven and surveys from above what is disclosed to him as existing in the various firmaments below him and in the earth, the angels, celestial bodies, and everything that is moving on the earth. So he's kind of looking down and seeing and seeing all of this. Bach also has a note here from Isaiah's story that, that matches this. He writes... It is said that Isaiah saw the seventh heaven, a wonderful light, and angels innumerable and all righteous from the time of Adam. So we know that the angels were created before Adam was created, so that makes sense. And the seventh heaven contains judgment and righteousness, the treasure of life, peace, and blessing, the soul of the departed, righteous, the spirits and souls yet unborn, the dew with which God will make the dead, the seraphim, the Ophemen, the Hayok, and other angels of service, and God himself sitting on the throne of glory. No doubt that the dew in our passage is the resurrection dew. Fire and light are much dwelt upon in this context. And I looked from the mountain in which I stood downwards on the sixth firmament and saw that there were a multitude of angels of pure spirit without bodies who carried out the commands of the fiery angels who were upon the eighth firmament, as I was standing suspended over them. And behold, upon this firmament, there were no other powers of any other form, but only angels of pure spirit, like the power which I saw on the seventh firmament. And he commanded that the sixth firmament should be taken away. And I saw there on the fifth firmament the power of the stars, which carry out the commands laid upon them, and the elements of the earth obeyed them. Whoa, guys, let's read that again, because we have been talking about astrology so much on this channel especially within the missing books of the bible we know that astrology is not of the devil it's not evil newsflash if you're not aware of that if your church is teaching you that it's evil that is nazi propaganda from world war ii it's called the hess act i've talked about that a lot you can look it up and i actually asked this question when we did our episode with melissa red pill and mickey clan and i actually asked tamara this off camera um, what they thought planets were, right? What are what are planets? Because we don't really know anymore because NASA, you know, NASA's liar, liar, pants on fire. So we have no idea what the stars and the planets actually are, but they do seem to have a, a understanding, a consciousness, these stars and these planets. And these constellations have names and stories associated with them. And if you listen to the episode with uh, David Zublick, Mickey Klon, and Melissa Red Pill, the Nation that we did a couple of weeks ago on David's channel. I will link uh, a link to that episode in the description box below for you guys to be able to go watch it. Melissa and Mickey basically break down Revelation, the book of Revelation, by reading the stars. And it turns out, it turns out, my friends, that the book of Revelation is not a scary book at all, but it's actually like the best news possible. And all the scary things that are talked about in Revelation are not about us. The tribulation is not about us. It's about them. It's about the Canaanites, the cabal, you know, the um, quote unquote deep state, if you will. We know what they do. There's a very fine line there between good and evil, the cult of the dark versus the faiths of the light. And so let's read that again, guys. You know, in the Bible, it does say, Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. And it is quite funny that I have been asking this question, and boom, 
Here is the answer in the Apocalypse of Abraham. And he commanded, so I'm reading this again, and he commanded that the six firemen should be taken away. And I saw there on the fifth firemen the power of the stars which carry out the commands laid upon them and the elements of the earth obey them. Right? That's astrology. Okay, so it looks like the stars, the planets, Aquarius, Gemini, Capricorn, Scorpio, all these different constellations are in the fifth firmament. All right, and they are given commands. So they have an intelligent understanding of the commands that are given unto them, and they move with those commands. They deliver those messages within themselves, and then the elements of the earth, of our plane of existence, obey them. As above, so below, right? What is happening up in the heavens is being reflected upon the earth. Boom. There you go. All right. Sorry, I got really excited over that because I can't stand it. Something that has really irks me is how much the church has lied to us. The church is just as evil as any of these evil organizations that we talk about. They have lied, 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 lied about everything because they don't want us to have a relationship with God. They don't want us to know God. They say they do, but they invert everything so that we don't. But we're on to them, and we're moving forward now. All right, so this brings us now to chapter 20, the promise of a seed. So this brings us to chapter 20, the promise of a seed. And the eternal mighty one said to me, Abraham, Abraham. And I said, here I am, Marco Polo, right? And he said, consider from the stars, which are beneath thee, and number them for me, and make known to me their number. And I said, When can I? For I am but a man of dust and ashes. And he said to me, As the number of the stars and their power, so will I make thy seed a nation, and a people set apart for me in my heritage with Azazel. So again, Azazel is the incarnation of evil. Lucifer, Satan, the devil, whatever you want to call that being, that is its incarnation, that's its name in this uh, apocalypse of Abraham. We've seen these biblical, spiritual, for lack of a better word, we'll say characters, have different names throughout these different works. In the book of Jubilee, uh, he was Mastima. And my favorite was actually in the Apocryphon of John. He was Yeldabaoth. That's the best name I've heard so far, Yeldabaoth. But it's all the same thing. Just as Shakespeare said, a rose of any other name would smell just as sweet. It doesn't change who this being is, this entity is, by changing its name. It's still the same entity. So Azazel is its name in this book. We talked a lot about Azazel last week with Yom Kippur and that whole beginning of Azazel's existence within our own human knowledge. So if you missed, again, part two, please go back and listen to it. It is in the description box below. And so basically God is telling Abraham that Abraham is going to create many nations. We know that Abraham is the father of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And through his grandson Jacob, he has the 12 tribes of Israel, which then shattered all over the world. And so basically God is telling Abraham, you're going to be the father of a bunch of people all over the world that are my children, that praise me. And we have this heritage with Azazel, this battle between good and evil. And they will stand on the side of good with me under your umbrella, basically. And he said, O eternal mighty one, let thy servant speak before me, and let not thine anger kindle against thy chosen one. Lo, before thou leadest me up, Azazel invade against me. How then, while he is not now before thee, hast thou constituted thyself with him? So Abraham has asked the question that was also asked in the book of Jubilee, and a question that a lot of us ask. Like, why? Why does Satan exist? And a God is so powerful as the God we worship, the creator of everything. He has the power to squish out Satan, to get rid of him. But we know from the book of Jubilee, there was a contract between God and Satan, some agreement that he would let Satan or Azazel, as he's called in this, in this book, serve a particular purpose. And this purpose was to give man free will. If man doesn't, since man ate from the 
the tree, the knowledge of good and evil now understands good and evil, the man ha now has to have the consequences of making that choice between good and evil. And as we learned from the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, and we've seen that in these other missing books that should have been in the Old Testament, the Israelites, the seeds of Abraham, aren't necessarily biological. That anybody that praises God, anybody that stands in the light, anybody that's service to others, anybody that has empathy and compassion and loves the Lord, are all Israelites. doesn't matter what your heritage is through your DNA, how, how you grew up. It matters what you choose. And so like many people in modern times and ancient time, times, Abraham is like, why not just not give us a choice and let us live in happiness? Well, we know the, that the a thousand years of peace is coming where Satan will be defeated for a thousand years. But this brings us to chapter 21, a vision of sin in paradise, the mirror of the world. So again, as I just said, talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and since we even Adam ate from that tree, now man has the understanding, the consciousness of understanding right from wrong. Um, and so that gives us now, now that we, we have that understanding between right and wrong, we have to live out the consequences of having that understanding between right and wrong. And we have to pick whether we're going to choose light or darkness. That also means that with that consciousness, we have things like emotional pain and empathy and compassion. So there's a lot that goes with those consequences. So here we go, chapter 21, and he said to me, look now beneath thy feet at the firmaments and understand the creation foreshadowed in this expanse, the creatures existing on it and the age prepared according to it. And I saw beneath the surface of the feet, the sixth heaven and what was therein and the earth and its fruits and what moved upon it and its animate beginnings and the power of, of its men and the ungodliness of their souls and their righteous deeds and the beginning of their works and the lower regions, and the perdition therein, the abyss and its torments. I saw the sea, and its islands, and its monsters, and its fish, and the Leviathan, and his domain, and his campground, and his caves, and the world which lay upon him, and his movements, and the destruction of the world on his account. And I saw their streams and the rising of their waters and their windings, and I saw there the Garden of Eden and its fruits, the source of the stream issuing from it and its trees in their bloom and those who behaved righteously and i saw therein their foods and blessedness and i saw there a great multitude men and women and children half of them on the right side of the picture and half of them on the left side of the picture okay so he's seeing now the division and we talked about that in the first episode that we're going to see some of the roots of the Gnostic beliefs which were the least between uh, the left-handed path and the right-handed path. We also saw this on our deep dive on Anton LaVey. I will link that video also down in the description box below where Anton LaVey, the founder of the Satanic Church, had his daughter Zena baptized to the left-handed side of Satan. And again, many people want to tell you that the Gnostics were satanic. They were not. Remember, everything we're taught in the official narrative ain't nothing but an inversion of the truth. So the Gnostics were literally the, the first Christians. And so even before the New Testament was totally complete and written, they had these books. So they understood this idea of the left-handed path and the right-handed path, the light, the darkness, all different ways of talking about the two different sides of this battle. And we also know that when man fell, Lucifer did get dominion over the earth. That's why the cabal has been able to last for so long. That's why we have these monarchs and these corrupt systems for such a long time because he was given that dominion and now his time is up. All right, so this brings us to chapter 22, The Fall of Man and its sequel. And I said, O oh, Eternal Mighty One, what is the picture of the creatures? And he said to me, This is my will with regard to those who exist in the divine world council. And it seemed well pleasing before my sight. And then afterwards, I gave commandment to them through my word. And it came to pass, whatever I had determined to be was already planned beforehand in this picture. And it stood before me ere it was created as thou hast seen. So Box does have a um, 
note here that the whole concept, this whole concept of the Garden of Eden is strongly predestination. The whole course of creation, the rise of evil, and the coming of the righteousness is predetermined. So we know that. We know that. We see that in the Bible. It's all predetermined. We also see that a lot in um, Hindu manuscripts, the idea of Dharma being like the true path or the path of, of your fate, a predetermined life path. And so it's kind of the same idea that God knew he knew that man would fall. He knew it, but he allowed it to happen anyway. And again, that gives more complexity to the conscious of man to now understand right and wrong and to be able to pick their side. And I said, O oh Lord, mighty and eternal, who are the people in this picture on this side and on that side? He said to me, these which are on the left side are the multitude of people which have formerly been in existence and which are after the destined, some for judgment and restoration, and others for vengeance and destruction at the end of the world. But these which are on the right side of the picture, they are the people set apart for me from the people of Azazel. These are they whom I have ordained to be born of thee and to be called my people. So basically there are already souls that were on his side that are going to come through very powerful beings. I think we can look back through the history of the Bible and kind of see who these people are that are already been predestined to fight on God's side. Chapter 23. Now look again in the picture who it is who seduced Eve, Eve and what is the fruit of the tree that will know what there shall be and how it shall be to thy seed among the people at the end of the days of the age. And so far as thou canst not understand, I will make known to thee for thou art well pleasing in my sight and I will tell thee what is kept in my heart. And I looked into the picture and mine eyes ran to the side of the garden of Eden and I saw there a man very great in height and fearful in breath and comparable in aspect embracing a woman who likewise approximated to the aspect and shape of a man and they were standing under a tree of the garden of Eden and the fruit of this tree was like the appearance of a bunch of grapes of a vine and behind the tree was standing as it were a serpent in form having hands and feet like a man's and wings on its shoulders six on the right side and six on the left and they were holding the grapes of the tree in their hands and both were eating it whom i had seen embracing so let's let's break this down for a second he's saying that adam and eve were of great height we know that even though the Nephilim were giants, not all giants were Nephilim, if that makes sense. We know that there were giants already on the earth before, that there were men that were greatly, greatly tall. And so it looks like from this book, Adam and Eve were huge people, tall, tall, giant people. And as our days have gotten shorter, as we have, our lifespan has started to decrease, as we talked about in the book of Jubilees, so has our density is what I'm seeing in our natural bodies. And now as we start to go back into the age of Aquarius and our, our life, our health gets better, we might start to see ourselves getting taller again. And it's interesting that they describe the, the fruit from the, the tree as more like grapes. We always see it taught to us as the apple, but it looks like from this, this work, it's more like grapes. And if you look at the way that they're describing the serpent who tempted them, it seems like a Draco, doesn't it? It doesn't seem like an actual snake. It seems like the lizard, as we call them, the lizard people, right? Very interesting. And I said, who are these mutually embracing, or who is this who is between them, or what is the fruit which they are eating, O mighty eternal one? And he said, this is the human world. This is Adam. And this is their desire upon the earth. This is Eve. But he who is between and represents ungodliness, their beginning on the way to perdition, Azazel. And I said, O oh, eternal mighty one, what hast thou given to such power to destroy the generations of men in their works upon the earth? And he said to me, they who will to do evil and how much I have hated it in those who do it over them, I gave him power and to be loved of them. And I answered and said, O eternal mighty one, wherefore house thou willed to effect the evil should be desired in the hearts of men, since thou indeed art angered over that was willed by thee at him who is doing what is unprofitable in thy counsel? And that ends chapter 23. So we're kind of going over everything, every, over everything we just talked about, about having this plan, this greater plan between the battle of good and evil with the fall of man.
So this brings us to chapter 24. And he said to me, Being angered at the nations on my account and on account of the people of thy family who are to be separated after thee, as thou seest in the picture the burden of destiny that is laid upon them. And I will tell thee what shall be and how much shall be in the last days. Look now at everything in this picture. And I looked and saw there was before me in creation. I saw Adam and Eve existing with him and with them the cunning adversary and Cain who acted lawlessly through the adversary and slaughtered Abel and the destruction brought and caused upon him through the lawless one. I also saw impurity in those who lust after it and its pollution and their jealousy and the fire of their corruption in the lowest part of the earth. And I saw their theft and those who hasten after it and the argument of their retribution, the judgment of the great Azazel. And I saw their naked man, the foreheads against each other and their disgrace and their passion on which they had against each other and their retribution. I saw their desire and her hands, the heavy of every kind of lawlessness and her scorn and her waste assigned to perdition. Chapter 25, I saw there the likeness of the idol of jealousy, having the likeness of woodwork such as my father was wont to make, and its statue was of glittering bronze, and before it a man, and he worshipped it, and in front of him an altar, upon it a boy slain in the presence of the idol. Holy crap, you guys, holy crap, did y'all just hear that? Whoa, I saw the likeness of the idol of jealousy. So he's seeing a likeness like the idols that his father made. So it looks like one of his father's idol. It isn't necessarily his father's idol, but it looks like that. And there's a father worshiping it in front of the altar. And a little boy is slain at the bottom of the altar. Hello, Bohemian Grove, Epstein Island, Boom, boom, boom. Y'all, this is another reason why this book was banned. It says it right there in black and white. What is actually going on? Okay, but let's go on now. But I said to him, him, what is this idol or what is that altar? And who are they that are sacrificed? And who is the sacrificer? Or what is the temple which I see that is beautiful in art and its beauty being like the glory that lieth beneath thy throne? And he said, Hear, Abraham, this which thou seest, the temple and the altar and beauty, is my idea of the priesthood of my glorious name, in which dwelt every single prayer of man, and the rise of the kings and the prophets, and whatever sacrifice I ordained to be offered to me among my people, who were to come out of thy generation. But the statue which thou sawest is mine anger, wherewith the people angered me, who are forced to proceed from me from thee." But the man whom thou sawest slaughtering, that is he who inciteth murderous sacrifices of which are witness to me of the final judgment even at the beginning of creation. And I think we're going to stop it there. I know I said we were going to try to get through the rest of this today, but we just kind of had a couple of like mic drop moments in this piece of literature, this manuscript. I shouldn't say li literature because I actually do believe this should have been in the Bible. So we'll call it a manuscript. Um, so we're chap stopping on chapter, this is chapter 26. And so we'll pick up with chapter 26 next week because that is a lot to take in for today we know now that astrology isn't of the devil it's an act of god and we're seeing now why sin exists why azazel exists we've seen adam and eve in the garden they're freaking giants it looks like they're eating grapes not apples and it looks like satan wasn't necessarily a snake a serpent but an actual demonic being. And now we see this whole idea of a line being drawn between the left-handed side and the right-handed side, the children of good, the children of evil, the children of the serpent, the children of man, the children of God, all this kind of stuff. And now we're seeing that the idea of sacrificing actual human beings is being um, told to us in this this book and at the end of time so we're taking it from the beginning of time we're coming all the way to the end of times and God is saying like the actions of our enemy of Azazel has been the same since the Garden of Eden Eden up until the last days of this timeline which again in my opinion does not mean the world's going to end it just means that Satan doesn't rule anymore and we're all going to understand why and most of us on the channel absolutely understand what happens in these 
uh, ceremonies. We'll just say religious ceremonies. So we're gonna we're gonna leave it there. And next week we'll pick up on chapter 26, which is titled "Why Sin Is Permitted." Because I don't want to skim through this way too fast. I want us to sit with this stuff. Again, if you would like the PDF of this uh, book, I will be more than happy to email you the PDF. Just shoot me an email at esotericatlanta@gmail.com because I know sometimes it's nice to have it yourself. So just message me there. And once again, leave me your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. Please remember to be respectful to each other. Regardless of whether you think this book is legitimate or not, everybody is entitled to his or her own opinion. But what you're not entitled to on this channel is to say horribly mean things to people who have a different opinion from you. We have to be respectful to each other, which most of you are, and I greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate that because we are just all walking each other home and we're all trying to figure this out together because every single one of us on this earth has been lied to. It's up to us to unscramble all those lies together. All right, guys, thank you so much once more to Josh McKay for doing our opening music. If you would like to purchase the full song, there is a link down in the description box below. Thank you so much to Todd Roderick for helping me get this out to you guys today. I hope you're all having a fantastic week, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.